Hello, everyone. Am I audible? Yes. Uh, thank you all for joining in here uh, for our talk today. Uh, we are very excited to continue empowering 2023 with uh, great talks like the one being presented by Dr. Hanfukhle today. So, uh, a little bit about our chapter. Uh, we are the 2022 and 2017 Santa Clara Valley Outstanding Chapter Award recipients, along with the 2022 and 2017 Region 6 Outstanding, Cha Outstanding Chapter Award and the 2017 Best Chapter Award. So today's talk is going to be on miniaturized power, power management that disappears and merges with the environment and systems. I would like to thank our ITP co-sponsors and hosts, uh, the Santa Clara Valley uh, Section SSCS Chapter, the Santa Clara Valley Section BTS Chapter, Census Converge for hosting us. Before moving ahead, I would like to mention about uh, the Pell's Day. Uh, yesterday was the Pell's Day, so I would like to wish all of you a happy Pell's Day. Uh, these are all some of the advantages of joining PELS if you haven't done it already. Uh, you gain access to first class technical information in terms of you know, journal papers, uh, articles, letters. Uh, you get the PELS uh, e-newsletter delivered to your mailbox. Uh, uh, okay. So you receive IT3 uh, Power Electronics Society Digital Library. Uh, you, you can get access to the Power Electronics Magazine, Digital Electronic and Print. Uh, the ITP journal on emerging and selected topics in power electronics, the electronic version. Um, apart from this, these are just some of the uh, other advantages that I've mentioned here. No. If you'd like to become an uh, ITP PELS member, then the link is shown at the bottom there, uh, ITP-PELS.org slash membership. So uh, this is all the folks that make it all happen, you know, all the events that we bring forward together. Um, so I'd like to thank the support of our uh, San Francisco BDR uh, 2023 officers and volunteers mentioned here. Without their support, we wouldn't be, uh, we wouldn't, we wouldn't be able to bring these events to you. Um, so if you're not an ITP senior member yet, then uh, we can help you fix that. We can help you get the recommendation for the ITP senior membership. Uh, the ITP senior membership is the highest grade that one can apply for, and some of the benefits are listed over here, like recognition, you get the complimentary society voucher, uh, letter of recommendation, and uh, you get the announcements of all the elevations that are made in the section in society. And you'll be able to refer other candidates. So this is 2023 at a glance. Uh, the events listed, the first three events listed in yellow, these are the events that we've already had this past year. And you can find uh, you know, uh, slides and record, recordings for some of those on our website. I'll go over that in a bit. Today's talk is by Dr. Hantukli, uh, which is listed there in green. And then we have a couple of other talks coming in uh, in the later part of the year. So please be on, uh, on the watch out for uh, our emails. So if you want to look at our previous events, the past uh, event recordings, slides, then our website listed here is the place to go to. Uh, if you go to the website, then you will find in the past meeting section all the uh, presentations listed there and the uh, YouTube videos for the presentations. And you can also follow us on Twitter at SFBAC underscore bells. Another way to get uh, all the information regarding the various talks happening in the Bay Area is through IEEE eGrid. So if you register on IEEE eGrid listed on the uh, website listed below, then you get uh, newsletters twice a month to your uh, mailbox, and that way you can be updated on, like, on all the events going on in the Bay Area. <coughs> so with, with that, uh, thanks a lot for coming and get ready for a lot more. Uh, I would like to request you all to please put your phones in silent. Thank you. So I'd like to just go over a brief intro of Dr. Hankuk Lee. Um, Dr. Lee is an assistant professor at UC San Diego. He did his PhD from UC Berkeley in 2013, MS from Kais Korea in 2006, and the Bachelor's in Science from uh, HESD Hanoi with Vietnam in 2003. His previous experiences are wide-ranging from University of Colorado and Boulder. Uh, he, he was the co-founder of Lion Semi in San Francisco, California. 
uh, and he has collaborations with uh, Lapis, Sunnyvale, Intel, Oregon, or Oracle, California, and uh, others listed here. So, without further ado, I'd like to welcome Dr. Sir here, and the floor is yours. Thank you, Sir. Thank you very much everyone for uh, attending today and uh, I'm very excited to tell you that this is my first public talk in Silicon Valley even though I was in Silicon Valley for a long time but actually this is my first public talk. I gave talks at different companies and so on, it kind of somewhat kind of private in, in different companies. So I'm very excited, I just asked the organizer, just close the door, uh, my flight is not leaving until midnight so I'm going to keep you here for quite a long time so brace yourself. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay. so, so I was preparing for the topic that um, actually related mostly to the conference that you are attending which is with the sensor and low power and then I had some requests from the organizer that there's someone who could be interested in other topics that we are working on as well <laughs> and particularly related to motor drive and a couple of other uh, 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 directions that we have so this um, uh, talk will uh, be detailed in some parts of the design that we have for IC design and then some parts that are just general concepts how we approach different things in power delivery and power management for uh, modern uh, uh, electronic systems. So um, uh, I don't know how this is run in the talk so uh, I actually would entertain questions right in the middle of the talk if you want to do so, or you can ask at the, uh, the end, that's fine too. Alright, so um, I'd like to bring the, the talk to, uh, for you today in terms of the approach for next generation power delivery. These approaches of, you know, can be talked by many different people already, but I really want to emphasize on few key factors, that is integrated and miniaturized power management that could potentially disappear and merges with the environment and the systems. So what are those approaches and why do we need them? Um, I, I'd like to uh, uh, bring some examples of the research that we do and also particular designs that could enable this, uh, uh, this uh, direction. So as you all know, I'm not going to dive too deep into this. Silicon Valley is very familiar with the need for power electronics or power management. Uh, starting from the uh, implantable devices that we have inside our body, go to the electronic devices that are in the rooms or in the buildings that we have these days, and also going to the city level or going to the cross city or, or national level of the, power, uh, of the electronic system. All of these scaling either in power from um, microwatt to uh, kilowatt range, all of them need very efficient power management so that we can support these ubiquitous uh, and uh, electronic system. So what are we focusing on? The power measurement here has to be high efficiency, compact size. Very important factors for the edge devices. Edge devices are related to the things that we can uh, uh, distribute all over the place. So particularly, just a few examples, mobile device we want to extend the battery lifetime, implantable wire sensor network that for this conference, we want them to be ubiquitous and have indefinite lifetime. So power management is certainly related to this. Electric car, we want them to be charged faster or more miles per charge, especially more efficient drive. A lot of these things will fold in battery management, soft robotics as well. We are actually working on all of these topics in some of our projects in our group, but I'm not going to have time to talk about all of them. So I'm going to pick some directions and examples. So what is the drive for the uh, more efficient power management? This is one example to tell the message that I'm sure a lot of people here are familiar with. This is one very popular uh, uh, graph for microprocessor. The need from the application side is becoming more and more uh, for power management that we need more computation uh, units, we need more cores. When we need more core counts, we need more power supplies to individually manage them so that it can be efficient. One example here is that you don't want to go into the building as in the microprocessor chip and turn on power, meaning turn on power for all the rooms. You actually want to individually manage them and a different voltage and different switches as well. The same story applies to microprocessor or essentially any electronic system that you have. 
So that means when the floor or the building block numbers increases, you will need individual power supply rails increasing proportionally. And you know how many cores are counting up now? It is the same story for any in electronic system. Just new functions that you added, you actually want individually manage them. So as an example, we visually show you, I'm sure many of you are familiar with this, so very quickly I want to show you iPhone 12 and iPhone 13. You have the same story for iPhone um, uh, 14. Uh, the, all the red so-called area of power management. You can see how big it is, and somehow they just look more complex and more complex uh, generations after generations. Turns out that no Moore's law there to help, even though we have a great Moore's law for processor, we don't have a Moore's law for power management. And this is the part that if you attended ISSCC, Dr. Lisa Su talked greatly about how to manage the power and, and all the power efficiency for next generation heterogeneous system, but she didn't mention about how you actually deliver the power to them. You can imagine that heterogeneous system getting more complex, the power management will get more complex as well. I'm sure we need more people to work on this. So as an example on the right here, uh, this is the uh, Samsung Galaxy S20, same story for the later generations. If you see one side, it's just really just all the functional chips, like processor and so on. You flip to the other side, oh my god, it's just power management. Uh, so you can see very clearly how much power management area is getting getting uh, more and more, uh, taking more and more space. It's going to be getting worse. So how can we miniaturize? How can we make the power management area smaller and still try to deliver uh, the efficiency? Uh, we can try to increase the switching frequency. Why do we increase the switching frequency? A lot of these power converters, not anymore we use linear regulator. We want to use switching converter so that it can be efficient. If I back up one slide here, you can see that the active device is several chips here, but surrounding it, everything that you see in terms of the dots, those are the inductors, and those without the dots, those are the capacitors. So the passive components are just taking up too much spaces. So what is the way to reduce that, the size of the passive components? Well, you can try to increase the switching frequency so that you can make them work harder so that they can be small, uh, they can be uh, uh, miniaturized to smaller sizes, but maybe the component count is still a problem. How can you reduce the component counts for passive components? Well, you may be able to use some circuit topology innovations to further reduce that uh, uh, space system for power delivery uh, in this direction that we want to reduce the, the space in the area. So circuit and, uh, and topology innovations, my, my group is trying to contribute greatly in this uh, direction here. But we also need to combine with advanced manufacturing. And when I say manufacturing, it's not just the packaging side, and by the way, packaging is super important these days, uh, but not just the packaging side, but also the technologies of the active devices and passive devices and integrating them together. That is very important. And one last thing which is often ignored or kind of kept secret in many different companies like Apple is the system co-design. You want to design the power management not just a standalone unit anymore, but to be integrated with the load and to be co-designed with the load. This is often easier said than done because as many of you may imagine or saw in your own uh, experience, Power management is often the, you know, like uh, the service guy who just uh, uh, came to the table and then get told that you designed this ideal power supply for me. That's it. There's no negotiation between the two ends, um, the two sides. So system co-design here can help greatly improve the efficiency and also the size of the system as a whole. Okay. So what do I mean by integrated? Integrated or miniaturized power management approach, in my opinion, they are divided into four categories. So these four type categories here is trying to make this integration for the power supply to work with the load and work with the system so that we can code to optimize them together. The first one is very familiar with a lot of people, that is the physical integration. So you integrate the power supply with either heterogeneously or on the same die with the load that you have, either the, that is the processor or the sensor network that you have. 
so that you can optimize them together, but mostly reduce the size of, uh, uh, for the time measurement. So physical integration is really, really important and people have been doing it. But we also need architecturally, uh, or architectural integration. So for example here, the car battery that we are having now, most of the car actually have the battery underneath the car. So, and that is somewhat centralized, and then you just distribute that power all over the place to the car. But now, people are talking about more batteries. Where do, you, where do you put them? Well, the batteries can actually be put into the empty space in the car, for example, the door or the roof or some other places. But then, at that time, do you still want centralized power di uh, distribution or, and then, to different places? Well, probably not. You really probably want the uh, uh, power supply for this uh, door right here will be distributed I'm sorry, so the motor for this door will be distributed from directly from the battery right next to it rather than combine on this battery together and then redistribute it again so architecturally the power management also have to work and have to be co-designed with the, the, the whole system not anymore just a standalone even the standalone power converter may get 99%, a lot of people are talking about 99, 98%. Well, putting in the system maybe is a different story. So functionally, so power converter has been, well, give me an ideal power source, and then you supply the, uh, the, the load. If you can actually combine the function of the load together with the power supply, you can actually optimize it a lot. I will give you an example, and hopefully I can get to uh, 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 show you some uh, uh, with, the with, with the time permit here. We have the power in motor drive, and I will briefly talk about this later as well. In motor drive, it has been that we have a motor, we have a power conversion, so that we can deliver the power to high voltage, for example, and we have a delivery power, a power delivery network, and then we have the motor drive. All of these stages. If we can functionally integrate the driver, which means the three-phase inverter, with the power converter, with the power delivery, with the power conversion as well, if we can do that, we will be able to save a lot of inefficiency because of multiple stages. And I will give you an, a, a perspective of how we can actually do that, and it's already happening now. It, not there yet but people are trying to do more integration. This functional integration, I argue that it will be very important for that integrated power delivery together with the motor that a lot of cars company are trying to do to reduce the weight and improve the efficiency of electric vehicles. The last one, which is less talked about and somewhat similar to the idea of architectural, uh, integration is environment aware, but I want to emphasize on one particular thing. If this environment aware uh, power delivery is not about that you just close, you just co-integrated in the same and then architecturally integrated with the system, but you want to be able to exploit the environment for power delivery as well. And I will explain that with one example that my uh, uh, first and best uh, so far PhD student here actually developed very well, um, uh, sitting in the um, audience, uh, developed a smart cable power delivery that we utilize the inductance from the USB cable to make it not only a power delivery cable, but also part of the power converter and conversion as well. This fits into the theme that I have in the title that the converter is merging and disappearing into the environment. So, com yes. On your power delivery on the architectural side, um, do you only have an example on the automotive state? Because there's a very specific reason the battery is designed that way. Right. And it entirely to deal with crap safety and crap structure. Mm -hmm. You just need empty space to absorb the impact. Okay? So do you have another example where where you're looking at architectural changes uh, that may be better suited to the environment that it's in? Yes, so for architectural changes, I will make an example for, uh, for the motor drive. So the motor is evolving as well. It's not anymore that we have a very high voltage, the weight of increased power, which is increased high voltage anymore. Um, actually, it's still going, but I would argue that emerging technology is 
how can you change that motor structure to be lower voltage to exploit the advances in technology scaling? And with that, power conversion has to go along. So this is both functional but also architecturally integrated um, um, power delivery together with the load, or in this case, motor. Okay, so uh, another, so one example here that I can show you for physical but also architecturally integrated power delivery is uh, heterogeneous integration that I uh, uh, briefly alluded to earlier. Heterogeneous integrated power delivery together with heterogeneous integra uh, integration in the system. That having delivered the power to not just a processor, but maybe many cores in the uh, not maybe many cores in the processor, and, and maybe many other functions in the heterogeneous system. Uh, how can we deliver power to PA? Right now, it's separated into two chips. That is the power management chip, and also the PA chip. Is there any benefit of integrating them? Unfortunately, I'm not going to have time to talk about this particular uh, topic uh, here, but I will briefly. Uh, discuss the heterogeneous integrated system that we published at the ISSCC um, earlier this year. So overall, the challenges in power delivery, I think essentially boils down to these two points. We want to increase the power at the output. Somehow it turns out that all the loads, in order to make that efficient, go into low voltage. And when they go to low voltage and more power, that means higher current. With higher current, delivery will be an issue. So then we want higher voltage in order to deliver that more efficiently. And that means we have a high input voltage, high output current. This is the task that the power converter needs to take on. It's not easy. It, it, it is happening in, for example, in mobile applications. We have the lithium ion battery right now. That is for phone. But you can see that for laptop, we already have to increase this lithium ion battery voltage to 10 up to 12 to uh, 20 volt already. So then the stress on this power controller is, is high and still delivering high current at the output. So that is the challenge that keep getting worse. The same story for, for example, data center that we need to, you know, to support a kilowatt at the output, a kilo amp at one volt. We actually need to bring that kilowatt volt uh, power at 48 volts so that we can reduce the power distribution loss. Well, some power converter needs to take care of that. The, those power uh, point of load converter is really, really uh, 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 not challenging to, to design. Same story for cars. The story for cars here is not just that you need to deliver from the battery multiple stations down to engines, I'm sorry, engine is actually up voltage, but display processor and so on at the very high current. For engine, I kind of clumped into here, but you will see later that actually they might in the very near future need high current as well at low voltage. And we'll talk about that soon. So what are, I will, what are the converter magics that we have been doing? For those who are not familiar with power converter, I just briefly discussed a few converter techniques here. So for the converter magic, we use some plastic component to transfer the charge or the basic the charge from the input to the output. In terms of using uh, uh, inductor, we call it the switch inductor or the bus converter. That inductor here is essentially acting as a filter, and then if you switch this node between the in and ground, the filter, the inductor here will store the charge and then transfer that charge in terms of inductor current to provide to the output that you can regulate the output uh, voltage to what you want lower than the input voltage. So uh, this is quite high efficiency for fine regulation. The problem with this architecture is that this inductor now needs to take care of the full output current, which is kind of lossy when you go to very high output current. And also the inductor is exposed to the wide, the large swing at the input voltage. That means the inductance has to be high. That means the size needs to be large, not favorable. And so the inductor is very difficult to scale. But at least that is the most popular converter architecture these days. There are a lot of products that are doing this. In processor, uh, you know, Intel notably and, and famously implemented in their uh, Haswell, Broadwell, Skylake, and all the next generation's high performance processor with buck converter, going from 1.8 volt down to the core voltages that is lower than 1 volt, uh, using integrated inductor. 
you see the huge effort putting in how to integrate these inductors. And it's still not so satisfactory yet. I will come back to this point soon. Companies like Ferric Semiconductor, sorry for the, you know, not update the slide, Ferric technology is already in mass production uh, in, in, in some products right now. It's not coming soon anymore. Very famous, uh, some company in the Silicon Valley. So the next, or the, another uh, converter metric that we can do is using capacitor. That is switch capacitor architecture. Switch capacitor is, if you have four switches and one capacitor, you can try to provide one volt at the output by switching the, in, uh, uh, from the two volt input, uh, by switching the capacitor in series between V in and V out, or in the second phase, uh, I'm sorry, and in second phase between V out and ground. That's how you transfer the charge over the capacitor voltage frequency. This is great because the capacitor technology, if you don't know, are improving so fast way faster than the inductor technology, just to give you an example. Integrated capacitors these days can get to the density of 1.3 microfarad per millimeter square. Integrated capacitor with a thickness of close to 20 to 40 micrometer in thickness and the density is 1.3 microfarad per millimeter square. So inductor technology, I'm sorry, capacitor technology is so great uh, in uh, density, so it could be really good for power delivery, for power converter as well, except that because it's tried to transfer the charge in terms of the voltage, it has some deficiency if it tried to do regulation, fine regulation in the wide range as well. But we have, we have uh, techniques to try to solve this. How do we solve this? If we have multiple configuration, the switch capacitor is often optimized at one single point or small range, but if you can reconfigure the operation uh, between the connection of the switch capacitor, you can try to provide multiple optimal points. So you make the switch capacitor a little bit more complicated, adding more capacitors, you can spread out the efficiency more smoothly or more uh, flatly uh, across a wider range. So, but this is still, you know, a lot of complexity to put in the switch capacitor alone for the regulation. And the question at this point is, maybe switch capacitor is not supposed to, and not efficient uh, evidently, to handle both high efficiency and regulation at the same time. But what can we do about it? Well, we may have some other techniques that this paper and also this author is the only author that I know got two eyes two times the ISFCC awards for working on switch capacitor converter and power converter in general at ISFCC. One of the techniques that he proposed and really nicely is adiabatic soft charging for the switch capacitor, pure switch capacitor. So the idea of switch capacitor is that you transfer the charge from the input to output in terms of delta V or voltage ripple over the capacitor. You probably know that it is hard charging. So if you have a delta V, just RC time constant charge and discharge over the capacitor, you lose the C delta V square F loss. And that we call the switch capacitor loss. But if you charge that capacitor not by RC, but by some kind of current source, well, you don't lose that loss. You just linearly charge and discharge, it becomes lossless. So what is the next thing close to that? Well, if you can charge not by one single step, but you can charge by multiple steps, and the number of steps gets to the high enough. Then now you have n multiplied with v dd square divided by n, v dd divided by square. Oh, I'm sorry, v dd multiplied with delta v divided by n total square multiplied with f. That will reduce that loss essentially to zero if you can go to this number indefinitely. It's not easy to be done, but actually it was shown, and the students now is the very senior principal engineer at uh, Intel. Great place to, uh, to work uh, for exactly this topic. So, eight, we, so this one is just showing the point that switch capacitor can do a good job and we have techniques to solve this problem. And apparently, there are a lot of you know, interest in this work uh, since my publication from Berkeley uh, uh, in 2010, and then after that, IBM, uh, ECS Zurich, uh, 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 TI, Dialog, NXP, you name it, Intel, all work on switch capacitor trying to, trying to show it works. And in this photo was taken in 2018, um, 
that is the Xiaomi phone powered by Lang Semiconductor Technology, Switch Capacitor Technology, wirelessly charging the uh, iPhone using Switch Capacitor Technology for wireless charger. So, what is the message here? The message here is that it is not about what has a disadvantage. It's not about Switch Capacitor is having a problem. Yes, it has a problem, but can we walk around it? If you look at power converter as a single unit, a standalone unit that, well, it has a source and it has a load, the power converter does everything and anything in between, well, that is a bit rough. Maybe we need to dive in to see how we structure this power converter. If we use switch capacitor, the switch capacitor can be one stage in that, somehow synchronously working with the inductor stage, so that switch capacitor only handle the large voltage conversion ratio or voltage steps efficiently, but the fine regulation can be handled by inductor side. So with this architecture here, I call it the inductor first architecture, that we put the inductor at the input switch capacitor afterward, or the inductor last or capacitor first architecture, we can put it the switch capacitor first and then the inductor last. For those who are in power management here, you know that the you know, the most famous topology for this is the three-level converter. And we can also manipulate the two inductor stages at the two ends and switch capacitor in the middle. And of course you can think of it, the switch capacitor on the two ends and the inductor in the middle, or we call it the inductor middle architecture. So the key message here is that switch capacitor can do a good job, it just needs to be combined with a small inductor, and this is the key point. The inductor does not need to handle the full input voltage or full output current anymore. Switch capacitor can help reduce that stress so that the inductor can be more efficient as well as the switch capacitor. So multiple stitches can sound inefficient. How can we combine multiple stitches in as a single stage so that it can be more efficient? I will give you a couple of examples how we do that in my group. Now, in one of the architectures that directly address this uh, audience from the uh, uh, sensor converge um, conference. This particular topic is related to how do we work on low power for power converter. What is the power techniques that we do? Well, we really want to power these sensor networks or um, you know IoT devices indefinitely. Meaning that it has one battery that doesn't need to be changed all the time and when I say 10 years, it is all the time. So, we want to extend this indefinitely. That means we need to harvest energy from the environment, and essentially from the human activity uh, and, uh, and, and the environment. So there are multiple sources that we can harvest this. We can harvest from light or photovoltaic. We can harvest from vibration or uh, piezoelectric. We can harvest from heat uh, as a thermal gener uh, electric generator. And there are a lot and radio wave uh, as well. The key advantage is, is to address that battery lifetime and exploit the already available resources in the environment. So particularly in my group, we looked at this and we tried to address one of them uh, in this particular project, which is thermoelectric generator. So this thermoelectric generator has a specific output voltage from the thermoelectric, which is the input voltage to the uh, to the converter of zero, smaller than 0 0.1 volt, so smaller than 100 millivolt. Oftentimes, tens of millivolt, like uh, 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 from uh, 10, 20 millivolt to uh, 80 millivolt, 90 millivolt. So that is pretty challenging in terms of input voltage. Compared to triboelectric uh, generator here, that is emerging by the way uh, in the last few years, uh, going up to high tens of volt to hundreds of volt. And how can you convert those voltages into the battery voltage so that you can charge the battery for these IoT or sensor devices? So, uh, in this particular project, we use the boost converter using three level boost converter or TAG. So, uh, what I mentioned earlier is that we can combine the inductor with the capacitor in this way. So, the input voltage is really low. If we use just a boost converter with the inductor at the input and then two switches after that, we may need to use really large duty cycle and may not still be enough to provide the output voltage here. Let's say the output voltage of 1.2 volt and then the input voltage of 0.1 volt. That duty cycle will still be challenging to implement. 
So if we have a capacitor, flight capacitor to block that voltage, divide that output voltage down to two times, so instead of uh, uh, um, 1.2 volt swing at the inductor, now we're down to 0 0.6 volt swing, it will relax the inductor operation a lot. And that's the idea of this three-level converter, combining inductor and capacitor. So uh, we implemented this chip with a uh, boost converter completely integrated with everything, including the flying capacitors, so that we can have a complete system that similar to a product kind of level, having a, a, a power on reset, a control, a charge up, band gap reference, all these kind of things, um, and the startup scheme as well. Let me show you just a quick example of um, uh, the, the measurement setup that we have. So we have a model for the thermoelectric generator, uh, and then the chip that we test here, and then uh, the oscilloscope to measure that. Uh, this is the, uh, the chip that is in the middle. So um, for the measurement we show, uh, this is from the, our CIC scene 2021. Um, because it's a three-level converter, we have a circuit technique that to address the voltage balancing in this capacitor. So for those who are not familiar, the voltage balancing issue is that, well, you have one phase to charge that capacitor to 0 0.6, and you have the other phase to discharge that capacitor in series with the inductor to the output. So then the capacitor voltage actually has an indefinite solutions that you can still do that and the capacitor voltage can be anywhere but we want it to be specifically 0 0.6 volts so that we can reduce the stress on the switches and the inductor so that means we need to regulate that capacitor voltage and we call in our technical term we call it the voltage balancing for the capacitor so there are many techniques out there we have one technique that we use the current uh, uh, measure the voltage of the capacitor and measure uh, and, and regulate the current to charge and discharge the capacitor. So we can show that when the um, active balancing is on and off, uh, when active balancing is off, we have a difference in voltages of CP and CN or the, this node voltage and this node voltage of the capacitor. They are far away from each other. They don't, you know, abut to each other. That means. Uh, this capacitor voltage is not at the out over two. Compared with if we have the active balance on, they perfectly match, and that's how we can have a steep flight right at the middle of the out voltage. So, what is the impact? The impact for that is okay. So the impact for that is that we greatly improve the efficiency of the converter from around 60% without the active balancing. We can push it to above 80% uh, when the active balancing is on for this boost converter. And at peak efficiency, we achieve 86.7% at 200 millivolt thermoelectric generator voltage. Now, 200 millivolt is certainly not, it, it, it's a steady state, but certainly not in cold start or in many different operations of the uh, thermoelectric. So we also show that this thermoelectric can actually start from 90 millivolt at the input, cold start, meaning that just need to provide 90 millivolt, the uh, chip can actually start by itself from uh, uh, the, um, the uh, uh, self oscillation uh, using an off chip inductor, and then that inductor will also <coughs> be used as part of the uh, power converter as well later. So we have a three uh, um, stage. I'm sorry, three phase startup. So the first one is start up with uh, the oscillation, uh, self oscillation, and then after that we do the boost, and then after that when the boost voltage, the upper voltage goes high enough, we now can change to the three level boost to uh, exploit the efficiency of the power motor. To be compared with the state of the art, uh, the key thing is that we also have the Hartley oscillation to start the voltage, uh, start the um, to cold start the uh, thermoelectric generator harvester at 90 millivolt. Uh, in fact, it can start lower, but reliably we, we, we start at 90 millivolt. And then in the normal operation, assuming the battery is already there, we can start from, uh, the converter can uh, operating down to the input voltage of 20 millivolt. We use two inductor, one inductor, uh, which is really uh, small, but with high inductance for self-oscillation, for Hartley uh, oscillator, and then one inductor can be used in combination for the power converter. 
achieving the efficiency um, um, on par uh, with the best uh, state of the art out there. Okay, so that's the first work that I want to present here related to this um, uh, conference. What are the other approaches that we try to do for power delivery? The one approach for power delivery that I really want to bring to you is what I said earlier about the power management to be merged with the environment. So I kind of pick it a little backward for this uh, environment aware integration. So what do we do with this? The key idea here is that if we have the right converter architecture, that we step down the power, the, the voltage from the input to the lower up voltage, but we put the inductor at the input and then some reconfigurable switch capacitor after that. If we can do that, now the inductor at the input, we do not need the decoupling capacitor for that inductor anymore because that inductor can be part of the environment. In this particular case, we try to apply it for battery charging. Battery charger has a table. So if we put this converter at the receiving end of the cable for mobile device, for example, in this case the phone, then that means the inductance, the process inductance of this USB cable can be turned into power inductor. So before we did this, uh, and after we did this, a lot of people asking, well, that inductance is going to change when you fold the cable and so on, and you, you don't have a reliable uh, power converter. Turns out that, no, it doesn't change, no matter how you fold, because that inductance is formed in the coaxial cable. It's not like the wire that you go outside that depends on the loop and how you fold the cable. No, it is actually just internal to the coaxial. The flux is just inside. So then you can fold whatever you want. It just depends on the length of the cable. But as long as we can put that converter to have a, to accept a wide range of inductance starting from about 100 nano Henry, then it should be fine. 100 nano Henry sounds, I don't know, for some people it sounds pretty large, for some people it sounds really small, but I can tell you that 100 nano Henry inductance is just about 10 centimeter of cable. The cable that you often use in about the length of one meter, it is about six to 700 nano Henry. Because if you just make a screen, I'm sure a lot of people are familiar with one milli, oh, I'm sorry, one uh, nano Henry per millimeter for one wire. So that means one micro Henry for one meter. But because of the coax, so it has a return path, so that's why the inductance goes down to around half of that when we have uh, one meter cable. So this was published in uh, ISSCC 2019. And some very important company in the Silicon area actually considered this very seriously. And turns out that the idea triggers a lot of interest from the academic as well. Many papers are actually following suit. And I will show one example uh, shortly. So what did we do? We actually implemented this integrated chip, uh, show all the operation of a standard converter um, with transient operations, with uh, um, current transient, low transient, voltage transient, and so on, achieving the peak efficiency O. So this converter is stepping down for this version only from 9 volt down to the lithium ion battery voltage. So maximum of 9 volt. So this 9 volt here, if we provide to one cell or two cell battery, we can achieve the efficiency of peak efficiency of 94.3% or 97.4% uh, respectively. So if you're interested, you can look up our ISSC paper or we can chat afterward. Now, you may wonder, well, cable, and you try to switch it, is that an antenna? Is that emitting some EMI issue? We were worried about that as well, and KC did a great job of actually testing it. Building the structure, go to the lab, the EMI lab, and I could test it in the EMI chamber, getting all the specification, uh, I'm sorry, getting all the testing, actually satisfying the uh, CRISPR uh, uh, specification does be standard for USB cable, okay? With very minimal capacitance that you need to add. I think it's in the range of one to 10 nanopower, uh, nano which is really, really small. And by the way, we also tested this smart cable idea with transferring the data at the same time. So we verified that it can be used. That's why it triggers a lot of interest. 
particularly, yes. Or I have a question. For this configuration, did you try only like USB A cable or did you also try USB C? That's a great question. And it gives a segue to our next project. So it only addressed the nine volt. So it's it's half of USB C and then mostly USB A. Okay? But then we have a limited in voltages because of converter topology. If you remember this is this is the hybrid converter that I said switch capacitor has a limitation in conversion ratio. So that's a limitation that our input will have. But we will address it in the next project that I will show you soon. Now, this, pro this uh, is the ISXTC 2023. It's not from our group. It's from a group in Macau. Trying to do the reconfigurable bidirectional power delivery at 42 watts. And this is the USB-C cable that they tried to demonstrate. And this is the real figure that they actually demonstrated this chip with the uh, you know, capacitor, one capacitor that put on top. Uh, of the chip with one wire that is to the cable. You see how this actually can be done with integrating the power converter into the USB plug. So uh, they showed it very well, way better than we could do before beforehand. But they they, they said at the conference that we were the inspi uh, inspiration for them to do this. So what can we do to increase the input voltage? So this one KC came through. KC came up with an, you know, another architecture that we now need to increase the input voltage. So we need some reconfiguration for the switch capacitor. So not anymore that we can just put the inductor at the input. What if we put also another switch capacitor stage at the input to reconfigure it so that it can block not 9 volt but now 20 volt as well. So then we can combine these two switch capacitor stage with the inductor in the middle KC calls it the Siemens converter or single inductor multiple stages converter or inductor middle uh, topology. So with this one, uh, uh, KC also implemented the um, uh, full integrated, uh, sorry, not full integrated, the integrated chips with all the control drivers, uh, power switches, and so on. Only the passive components are on chip, uh, and demonstrated this at ISSCC uh, earlier this year. Implemented in 180 nanometer high voltage PCE process. Go up, the converter goes up to 24 volt at the input, reconfigurable to support down to 5 volt, while supporting the output voltage of lithium ion battery, one single cell. So, to be compared with other systems, we support a very wide range of the input voltage to output voltage range, cover the full range of the uh, uh, USB-C standard and also uh, for the uh, single cell battery, uh, achieving really decent, decent efficiency for a battery charger. Uh, but the key important thing is that because the inductor in the middle, remember that we talked about the architecture, if when the inductor is in the middle, it does not need to handle the full output current anymore. It is only handling a small fraction of the output current divided by this second switch capacitor stage. But if you operate these two together, uh, these two stages together, they are not as a single stage with efficiency multiplication. It is a single stage. It is a single converter. And this, this inductor can soft charge uh, uh, the operation of the capacitors to achieve this decent efficiency. Okay. So that's the idea of merging the converter with the environment. That we can actually use the cable. What I didn't reveal is that we could put this on the two ends of the cable as well, and that's what we are working on. Now this can be a cable. The two ends can be switch capacitor. And that's how we can do this smart cable again with the reconfiguration. Yes? Uh, how do you deal with configuration? That's a great question. We are working on it. <laughs> we do have some ideas, but we are working on it. That's a spot on question. Yes? How do most switches, many let's see them divide but all those switches, all those switches are market switches, IEM, no process, and then what about the control in there? How no. complicated is the control? Yeah, that's a great question. So uh, these switches are not ideal. We solely implemented in the integrated circuits. So we have all the drivers, power supplies for them. How complicated it is, it's certainly more complicated than a bulk converter. But the trade-off here is that we are circuit designers. We deal with this kind of circuits 
challenges all the time. The key thing that we have to address here is the size of all the passive components and the power that we need to deliver. So then, taking the, the challenges of the circuit design and trying to say to serve this, you know, goods in, in terms of improving the power uh, and energy density and power efficiency, I think we can do it. And we proved that we can do it. But yes, it's more complicated. So these are implemented in the high voltage uh, BCD process. Uh, these switches getting up to uh, breakdown voltage of 12 volt. Um, some of them can be handled 20 volt. So high voltage devices. They are not low voltage. Uh, they are not core voltage. I'm sorry. Yes. So in the design optimization, we certainly need to optimize for switching loss and conduction loss of these switches. So that's how we size these switches very specifically. As you can, uh, you might see here, switch three, four, seven, three, four, seven, six, and seven are different from one, two, and five. Uh, so in this particular case, and you, you can look at our paper later, these switches are low voltage switches. These switches are at the inputs. They need to deal with the inputs, so they handle high voltages. So that's why the size is the difference. Definitely size for the both switching loss and conduction loss. That's a great question. Okay. Uh, yes. <laughs> I'm sorry, I cannot hear. Uh, do you use the USB PD to point out your power to regulate the input voltage? Yes. So um, the 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 method that we design power converter is that because we do it some something like multi level. When we do multi level, we actually have multiple voltages just generated from the converter itself, so we can uh, 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 basically benefit off of that to generate the voltage, the middle voltage levels for the drivers. So the startup and all of these startup and uh, initialization is really important, and Casey actually spent great effort on implementing those for this converter. In the interest of time, I request the audience to hold up the questions until the end, so that Dr. Lee can get to the question. All right. Yeah. The question is actually feeding my energy. <laughs> Thank you very much. Okay, so uh, let me move on to the last few topics. That are, these topics are probably a little bit less uh, detailed, uh, but I'd like I'd like to address uh, basically bring the um, um, you know my excitement about the different projects that we have. So uh, in terms of making the integrated converter, well, the ultimate thing is that integrated, right? Physical integration. So. How can we integrate these passive components? Well, it turns out that our group is clearly not passive component designers, so we need to work with someone. We need to work with um, companies who like to design integrated capacitors, integrated inductors. In this particular case that we have uh, my student Roger, she here, uh, working on the integrated uh, converter with uh, what we call the uh, transformer-less uh, uh, dual-active bridge converter. So essentially it is the using the really small inductance of around 10 nanohenry, but can block the input voltage of 12 volt at the input, stepping down to 4 volt at the output, soft charging the capacitors at the same time, and operating at low switching frequency, only 4 megahertz. So it does have a narrow, a good narrow range regulation, and we are working towards the uh, wafer level chip scale packaging to integrate these inductors with the die. So the inductor that, uh, unfortunately, I actually uh, take this uh, uh, old figure, but uh, you know you can look at our paper, uh, the CITC 2020 uh, paper that actually got invited to JSSC. Um, these inductors are integrated inductors from ferric semiconductor, and uh, they are just like a die. Uh, 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 silicon die. So we showed that the converter can actually have a very fast uh, transient uh, regulation uh, within the four um, sub microsecond, uh, I'm sorry, several microseconds in terms of transient response uh, for the load current jumping from 0 0.2 to 0 0.7 amp. That means we have a regulation, not just like a, a you know a resonant converter. We want to distinguish ourselves with the resonant converter. So integrating the inductors. Where's the industry? Well, the industry is already kind of, you know, doing a lot of good work in that. This is one example that was shared at the APEC last year. 
This is the Apple uh, M1, and you can imagine M2 is doing similar thing. So they already using integrated voltage regulator, using integrated inductors attached to the other side of the processor here. So the message that I want to bring here, and we can share this slide uh, afterward, is that integrated inductor is the way to go for a lot of applications. How to make that technology better is still a lot, you know, a lot of struggles from different companies. But from our side of a circuit designer, we can and we should benefit of, of the technology development in plastic components, but we want to be integrating with them as well. So the topic, the next topic is, well, okay, so this power delivery is still at low voltage, 1.8 volt or so, very similar to the Intel Haswell and Broadwell uh, product series. Going down to the core voltage, that means you do reduce the input current by about two times. But that may not be enough. And particularly, for the Intel product, for example, <coughs> it's, it, it struggles a little bit, or significantly, with the power delivery distribution. The distribution right now is more lateral distribution, that you have a voltage uh, regulator of chips stepping down the input voltage, high input voltage to about 1.8 volt, and then lateral distributed to the core, I'm sorry, to the processor, and then processor goes in at about 1.8, deliver the, uh, using a book converter style uh, to provide to the processor, but then the inductor, you know, to improve the quality, it needs to go off chip, so when it goes off chip, we have multiple current pass in and out to get to the inductor. Unfortunately, that is high current, so then the loss can be very high. Uh, significantly enough that the efficiency of this converter, uh, of this fully integrated voltage regulator is about 90%. And by the way, even I criticize it, this is a respectable number. It's really difficult to get this 90% efficiency for fully integrated voltage. But that means the overall efficiency can still be limited at about, nine, uh, at about 80% if we have this voltage regulator here at the input of 90% as well. So what we propose and we implemented and demonstrated uh, uh, at ISSCC is what if we try to do more vertical power delivery, but not any vertical power delivery. We try to deliver it at the 20 volt down to 4 volt instead of 1.8 volt. And after 4 volt, we use switch capacitor instead. Now, we come back to the theme that I showed you earlier, that switch capacitor can do a good job, especially of integration and close to the load. So, if we can put the switch capacitor here, you know, we can step down the voltage to 4 volt, and then after 4 volt, we can have a direct current path of the switch capacitor integrated converter straight up to the processor at high current, without any loop back and forth to get to the, uh, uh, to get to the inductor. And the reason why we can do that is because the capacitor technology is improving so fast. The density is really high now that we can improve the very high uh, efficiency and high density power converter. And more importantly, we are already using capacitor on the package. All we need to do is to switch out those capacitors, those decoupling capacitors, with the switch capacitor converters, and then we come back with the two functions both decoupling capacitors and the step down voltage function that we can step down the current of the input for the power, for the better delivery so how do we do that very briefly the first stage right now we do three level converter to 20 volt down to um, uh, 4 volt and then after that we do a, a, a new switch capacitor 4 to 1 switch capacitor we use the capacitor from uh, Murat um, Murata technology, uh, sorry, Murata um, uh, as a company, and uh, for the integrated uh, capacitors. But for the first demonstration, because of the some struggle, as you may imagine, for those who are doing chip design, heterogeneous integration is not easy. We need to get the yield of both. The capacitor technology high yield and the die, the active die high yield, we are still a little bit struggling with that. But for the direction, the whole industry agree with this. We do need to have heterogeneous integration with or for the power converter, so that it can support the heterogeneous system. So this work was presented at the ISSC 2023. We are still uh, in the later development trying to uh, increase this input on this to 48 volt for data center application. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Sorry, for the previous one, can you go back and show that? Sure. So this one, uh, where is the regulator? Is the one volt is 
this is for the processor app for the processor yes. so it has to be tightly regulated so is the regulation done at the switch capacitor or on the uh, uh, on the switching on both on so both. the switch capacitor is doing narrow regulation okay. and then the inductor is doing most of the wide range regulation for efficiency so so the switch capacitor is narrowly regulating between 4 to 1 so 4.1 to 1 4.2 to 1 and so on and uh, the, switch, the, the the first converter will regulate whatever the voltage that needs to be to provide the 4 to 1 output after that efficiency great question and by the way we are still working on this it, it is it is actually a very interesting question that i have a PhD student dedicated for so Power management needs to be functionally integrated with the load. Now, this topic, I'm sure, is not uh, new to a lot of people. How do we integrate the uh, power converter with uh, the load here? Functionally, we can have a power management uh, to be envelope tracker provider to the uh, PA. But the key project that we want to address here is that, well, so far we're still talking about having the power converter as a separate die. Uh, and uh, somewhat integrate on the PCB. But then the, 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 link, uh, the, um, the prosthetic inductance between the power converter and the, the PA can be high. But benefiting from vertical power delivery, if we can actually put in a structure like this, the PA can be down here uh, with thermal interface material for the heat sink to the PCB, why the switch capacitor converter in this particular case or the power converter here can do the envelope tracker or power modulation for the uh, PA for the next 5G and 6G uh, uh, um, uh, communication uh, systems it will benefit greatly uh, for the efficiency of the system and we want to use this for base station for now uh, so we use uh, gallium nitride uh, technology for the integrated uh, converter so the last topic, I know I'm over time. How, mu how many more minutes that I can have? I'm sorry. Okay. All right. So um, uh, the door is actually not locked. So uh, in case that someone needs to go, I will try to finish this in five minutes. Okay. This is actually a very new topic for my group. Three. Okay. He said three minutes. All right. Um, power supplies in EV. When we talk about power supplies for actually any big system, there are so many different power supplies uh, that are needed for uh, processors, sensors, camera, you know, uh, power source for the battery, charging battery, and many motor drive as well. This topic, I'd like to talk about the motor drive for these hundreds of power rails on the die. I'm sorry, on the on the car. The motor drive is arguably the most power consuming and high power. So if we look at the um, um, in the industry and manufact uh, manufacturing sector, the power consumption for machine drive is about half of the full power consumption. And it's only getting worse. Okay? So we need a lot more efficient motor drive. You think it's efficient now? You can see that a lot of people are still trying to work on this to push a um, uh, 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 very last bit of efficiency because when we put very large bit of efficiency, we actually put a lot, we actually push a lot in terms of loss reduction. So what am I particularly talking about? We are very familiar with the motor drive in three phase. And in this three phase, oftentimes we have a power delivery look something like this. We have the, um, uh, 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 you know, uh, uh, battery at the input, and then after the battery, we have the charger. The battery is really, really high voltage here in terms of, uh, you know, 800 volt now for many cars and going up further. Uh, and then we need to have a high voltage, low voltage to deliver to light and other electronics, low voltage. But then for the motor drive, we even boost it up further to bring it to 1.2 one, one, one kilovolt or so. Uh, what do we want to do? We want to provide very high voltage to power the motor. Why do we want to do that? You know, to increase the power for the motor, we need to increase the flux to drive. And to increase the flux, the traditional way until now is to increase the number of turns so that we increase the flux combination. When you do that, well, you need higher voltage if you want to keep the same, uh, the same uh, uh, coil uh, uh, wire. So when you do that, well, they ignore, well, not ignore, but they think that, well, all the switches, the active components, 
for the motor drive is simple. Silicon carbide is now relatively new in the last 10 years, but now it's like a standard in motor drive. But silicon carbide itself has its own limit. Going to high voltage gives a lot of stress to this AC motor drive. So uh, in this traditional solution, it is actually great, and you can put more things in parallel, but the high voltage is still the theme here. So if we have the high voltage switches, it creates a lot of stress on the devices, and particularly in the Silicon Valley, I believe you understand this very well. Those switches with high voltages do not scale very well and, adva uh, and, and take advantage of, of technology advancing or advancement, technology scaling. So we want to actually use internal technology uh, uh, scaling. We want to use low voltage switches and high current. That's what we want to do so that we can um, um, uh, benefit from the technology scaling. So there's the emerging uh, part uh, of motor drive that we do in modular motor drive. So the motor now is being divided into multiple sections connected in series. So each section now, or each portion here, just occupy a smaller fraction. Let's say in this particular one, is a 330 volt, uh, and stack six of them together, we will have the 2000 volt as the input. Now, stacking like this, we will have uh, assumed balance operation. We can have a lower voltage uh, to uh, uh, stress the uh, switches here. So it's good. It's actually benefit from technology scaling. But you see the trend. Can we push this further? What is the limit of that? Is that 330 volt is the great choice? Um, and how about redundancy in all of this um, uh, structural uh, uh, integration of, of the motor? But at this point here, you see that the trend of the modular motor is really nice in that. The, in, the inverter, not any more single inverters that are off the side of the motor, but it can be distributed around the motor, which is really nice in terms of heat distribution and thermal distribution, thermal uh, solution as well, and cooling. Oops. So our proposal here is that, well, how about switch capacitor? Now exactly a switch capacitor, I cannot share with you yet what, what kind of architecture here we use, but if we can use switch capacitor here, switch capacitor turns out to be exactly similar to the half bridge. So if we use some switch capacitor, it can provide the function of power delivery together with the drive and together with the uh, uh, power conversion at the same time. So then it can be also distributed uh, uh, around the motor nicely uh, um, and it supports module uh, shedding toward more integration. The last slide here I want to show is the next generation of the motor. The thing is that how can we push it further? We talk about 300 volts, does that mean we still have a lot of turns there? How about turnless? How about no more turns? The, 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 the trajectory is changing from high voltage for each cell for, to have a higher flux. Well, the flux can be generated not just by the number of turns, but by the current that you push through the wire. So now if you can use low voltage, but you push a lot of current through, you don't need a lot of turn. You can still generate a very high flux. Before this, why don't we do it that, that way? Well, because of the, you know, the, the, the normal DC motor that we are familiar with, and the, easy, the, the easiness of trying to do it uh, in the high voltage. I think we reach to some certain limits of the high voltage active device, then maybe we want to look back again of how to take advantage of advanced technology scaling. So in this motor evolution, coming from uh, you know turns like this, if we can actually split uh, split it out in terms of single half a turn, combine it in one side like this, then we can have the motor structure that looks something like this. Sorry, uh, I should have put in the, this reference. There's a uh, master thesis work at UCSD a few years ago that actually um, uh, showed this. And you can combine this into uh, multiple units in one motor that is in the 20 kilowatt power. It can have about 60 poles or 60 prefaces. Now, how to drive this? 60, how to drive this? Well, if you see the theme here, we are not about high voltage single power delivery, but distributed. If we can do distributed at low voltage, and we can do it efficiently, this will greatly improve the future motor for the better.
And this is the, you know, the idea of Sunless Motor, and we are trying to support. We are not the motor designer. We actually work with some uh, uh, startup company that are trying to do this, and we design the power uh, delivery, how to do this efficiently and distributively, so that it can improve the efficiency. So this one I just passed. So uh, I, I'm not the one who physically do all of this. I work with all my great students. Two of them uh, have graduated. Casey Hardy is actually in the audience here, and Batu Das also graduated. Um, and then I have uh, a total of eight students now. Uh, thank you very much for your attention, and I hope this stirs up some ideas that we can collaborate in the future. Sorry for keeping going. Thank you, Dr. Lee, for a wonderful talk. Um, I'd like to now request the audience to please raise their hand if they have questions, and I'll come over the mic. So uh, if you uh, see uh, this part right here, so what is drawn here is that these are representing the switcher. So the switcher has to be really close um, to drive this, you know, essentially motor model here. This motor coil is a motor coil, it's a like single turn. So the inductance is really low for the motor, not like a Mini Henry in regular motor. So now it has to be really close to drive the high current, and also the switches have to be very efficient. So what technology that we are doing, or what we are using, so we are uh, predicting that in the future we'll have the um, really good, more good switches in addition to gallium nitride, but in the first step we are targeting gallium nitride for, for switches, so to drive very high current. So uh, MOSFET switches are great, but may not be good enough. So we are, we are implementing and trying to target in um, gallium nitride switches. But in the future, we, um, we believe that other better switches at low voltage will come about as well. So uh, just to add one more point about gallium nitride. Gallium nitride right now, I'm sure um, uh, you are familiar with that we don't have a lot of chips gallium nitride yet and the drivers can be an issue, um, but I can tell you that uh, the technology in gallium nitride technology and integrating the driver with gallium nitride is moving a lot faster than actually I thought, so I'm very positive about uh, that direction. Um, yeah, my question is uh, on the uh, kind of multi-level and switch pack capacitor uh, converters. So I'm wondering, uh, um, what's your take on like uh, these technology in the case of like a really high step down ratio and kind of what's the extreme case uh, that you see uh, being, uh, this circuit being applied um, uh, in, in achieving uh, good efficiency converters for those applications? Yeah, that, that's a great question. So related to high conversion ratio, what we have done uh, so far is 48 volt down to 4 volt or 1 volt. So the conversion ratio is still in the range of, if 48 to 1 is very high, right? But the switch capacitor is often in the range of uh, about 8 to 1 or so. Um, uh, if you push further than that, the gain in reduction of voltages for the switches is less, and the loss of the conduction loss of the switches are increasing. So, uh, so far we don't see the benefits of increasing the number of levels further and complexity will just kill us at that time. So uh, about 6 to 8 is a sweet spot that we see now. Um, if we need to support even larger conversion ratio, let's say that uh, um, uh, going from 400, 400 volt down to 4 volt for example, in some application, at that time we may want to use architecture like DCX, which is like a transformer. Uh, but it is, and, and using transformer in some particular case, that is a strict conversion ratio, but utilizing the passive components very well, that it doesn't have a regulation in the subject matter. So you, you can use that kind of application. I have a quick question. Yes. Um, I, I worked at Lion Semiconductor on some switch cap stuff, and it, it got very complex and hard to simulate, so 
Can you comment on what kind of design tools you use for switch cap? Um, okay, we use like a standard tool um, that is Cadence, and you're right that the simulation takes a lot of time. In fact, all of the switching controller takes a lot of time because uh, the simulator actually needs to dissect you know, the timestamp in terms of the transient for each switching action. Um, how long is a, uh, um, is a switch? I'm sorry, is a simulation for one top level simulation? It often takes about a day or two, even. So it is not that efficient. There are many companies out there trying to improve this um, um, this um, uh, uh, simulation process. So, for example, one company that I know in uh, Korea named um, X, um, X Design, uh, they, they are actually trying to improve this. That, that's a great question. But it applies to all switching converter, not just switch capacity. I want to point out. Yes. Yes, thank you for your presentation. Uh, I have a question regarding the, the three level uh, converter. You have to talk about the capacitor voltage balancing. Yes. I wonder, you know, you not to do that, do you need a regulator or just need a converter to do that? Okay, so I don't have a slide for it, but Casey did a great job at ISSCC showing this voltage balancing. Very quickly, the way that he tried to do this is that he sends the capacitor voltage and then try to balance the two dB cycle uh, in the charging and discharging of the capacitors. So if you have a higher voltage in the capacitors, you may want to discharge it more, right? So you can tune that dB cycle. But the way that KC implemented this is you can decouple the loop to regulate the capacitor voltage from the loop to regulate the output voltage. So then these two can be completely orthogonal, uh, you know, uh, independent, so that they don't interact with each other. But yes, we still need to sense the capacitor voltage to do this. And this is the voltage regulation. That loop can be really slow though. It doesn't need to be fast. So it's actually an easier loop to do it. Easier, but it has to be handled uh, in a smart way. Yeah. I wonder if, let's say, we just use a compar comparator instead of, uh, you know, error amplifier or amplifier to regulate. Just use the converter. Yes. 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 Absolutely. So all the feedback network, right? Either you use an amplifier or you use a comparator as a single bit ADC. They are similar in in, in they, are, they are similar in that way, right? They just sense the feedback. Either you use the bang bang control in terms of comparator or you use the amplifier. In my opinion, this is the techniques, the different techniques, but the idea is the same. Yes. Um, in terms of uh, circuit simulation, uh, just two quick questions. First, do you run into a lot of um, convergence issues with those switching circuits? And second, um, do you know that Linux Cplex um, is a better solution because it's optimized to get rid of this uh, switching, this continuity of convergence problems? So I heard the first question is um, whether the, sim um, the simulation takes a long time, is that right? No, I mean convergence issues, which you don't get a solution, but it's stuck. Ah. So I will try to find some yeah. like maximum minimum for convergence. Yeah, yeah. Uh, every tip out we have once or twice <laughs> tried to face the problem of convergence issue. Uh, now, the, 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 the key method that, that we experienced in trying to solve this is use less ideal components you know, the, 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 the idea at the beginning is that, okay, we use the ideal, you know, gate drivers and so on. Turns out that those ideal components just mess up the simulator. So use less ideal components, and whenever you have a convergence issue, go to those ideal components, surrounding the ideal components first. And then if you turn into most of the circuits into the transistor level, then that problem is much less. Now, it still happens. Uh, back at line, actually, we had one incident that my engineers, civil engineers and I actually spend a lot of effort trying to you know, find out this particular conversion issue and frankly at the end we didn't know how we fixed it. We should change something and finally the conversions went away and then that, that fixed it. But, but it's a difficult problem to solve. And the second question is? Uh, uh, I'm, I'm talking about the simulator, right? it's a modified spice. Well, there are two actually. I think the better one is probably black, P L E C. Wow. Oh. Yeah, black, black. Yeah. Do you think that's a better uh, one for this kind of switching simulation, even with this uh, highly complex switching regulators? 
Yeah, if I hear correctly, you are referring to some settings in the analog uh, uh, design uh, simulator. I think if I may, uh, he's referring to the simulator called Flex for modeling the, uh, the switching converter. Flex. So, yeah. Oh, yes. We always use that from the beginning. But then when we go to integrated circuits, we, uh, we, we use it in part of, but less. So uh, Plex is really popular from, uh, I'm sorry, it is a default tool uh, at the beginning when we verify the ideas and so on. And that does not have a conversion, most of the time does not have a conversion issue. Yeah, we, we love Plex, by the way. Yeah. So let's uh, move on to uh, TEGs. Uh, under certain... Uh, applications, the, uh, the thermal difference is the swap. Oh. So if you had one side that's hot, the other side is cold, well, the one side that's hot, the other side is hot. How would you uh, recommend approaching uh, and it's full of rectification in this case? Okay, so... And maintain high Okay, this is a creative question I'm, I was, I'm not prepared for. <laughs> But let, uh, let me try to approach that. So uh, in our chip, we didn't need to deal with that problem. We uh, have a you know, um, known uh, side of hard and side of cold. But you're right, it could happen. And I can think of it as a similar to analogy to um, piezoelectric. Right? You have actually have the uh, AC signal at the input. So if it happens less uh, regular, like very regular in piezoelectric, that you actually have a full wave rectifier, and then you can uh, detect that. Uh, then I consider, in this particular case, I consider it's low frequency. If it's low frequency, sure, we can put in the uh, full wave rectifier, but with the detection, that the detection, when it flips, it only need to change the switching once. So in this case, we only care for the conduction loss, we don't need to care for the switching loss. So that would be my take on it. Yeah. But I can imagine that the handling of the uh, substrate bias is not easy. We need to be careful with the um, with the substrate bias because when it flips, right now it is a different terminals. Which one is higher? Which one is lower? But in the literature, we have done that a lot for the for the rectifier switches right. for the body bias. Uh, last question. Uh, we can take one more question. Thank you so much, Dr. Lee, again, for a wonderful talk. Uh, I'm sure the audience found it very informative and exciting. Uh, thank you for that. And I would like to thank the audience for uh, joining us today uh, and attending this seminar. I hope you join us in our next events, whether it be uh, in person seminars or uh, online webinars. Thank you very much. I want to give a shout out to uh, Kishan and all the organizers here with Brian as well. This deserves the best chapter clearly, right? You already have the award, but this this really the best chapter and I, I'm not sure you know how lucky you are in to be in the chapter that have a many different um, a nice organization like this. So uh, thank you very much again and hope uh, hopefully we meet again talking in more detail. Bye everyone.